Kia ora, namaste, assalamualaikum, sastriya kal, kemcho, varakam, nisa bula vinaka. Welcome to COP Chat. I'm Jessica Puang, the Ethnic Responsiveness Manager of Tamaki Makoro for the New Zealand Police. First of all, I'd like to thank Abna TV for allowing to use this platform to reach out to the communities. Today, I have the privilege of inviting Inspector Shannon Gray, the District Prevention Manager of Waitemata District. Welcome, Inspector Shannon Gray. Thank you very much, Jessica. It's great to be here. Yeah, thank you for coming. And uh, you are the Waitemata District uh, Prevention Manager. And I'm sure many of our audience would like to know, what, what, what does that role mean? Can you share with us, please? Yeah, sure. So the District Prevention Manager in Waitemata, and, and much like the other districts around the country, uh, is part of the District Leadership Team, the District Governance Group. Um, so really my core role is making sure that all our people in the district are um, operating under our Prevention First model. Um, so really what that's about is ensuring that everyone's taking an opportunity to prevent harm in the community before it actually happens. Mm -hmm. um, so that's uh, by making sure that people are safe on our roads, safe in their homes. Um, so I've got a, a number of work groups that work for me. Um, How in, many? In fact, I've well, <laughs> got to tell you, I've got, so I've got five inspectors that work, okay. uh, report to me, as well as one research doctor who does a lot of research for our district and across Tamaki Makaurau. Um, so just going through those, so I've got the District Road Policing Manager, so okay. um, he makes sure that everyone's safe on their roads and their journeys, um, you know, that we're trying to obviously reduce the number of people that die on our roads because too many people die on our roads, mm. as well as being involved in serious crash uh, injuries as well. So uh, that's my job and, and his job to make sure that, that uh, you know, we reduce that as best we can. Okay. Um, I also have the Director of um, our Family Harm Group, which is called Whanai Nga Pahara Kiki, yes. um, and so that group uh, is responsible for working across a whole of agencies um, to triage every family harm episode that comes into our district and make sure that we're referring those people in need, both the perpetrator and the victim, to the appropriate services and making sure that we can reduce uh, that family harm that's occurring in the homes as well. Mm -hmm. And making sure as well as the intergenerational stuff, so making sure the children who are exposed to family harm episodes are getting the support that they need. Um, so in addition to that, I also have our deployment team. So um, I have a deployment manager that um, reports to me and that's about making sure our people are in the right place at the right time doing the right thing. Um, I also have within that work group our district shift commanders uh, and their responsibility is our 24-7 operational command uh, and leadership in the, excuse me, in the field. Um, I also have our district intelligence work group, oh, wow. um, so <laughs> they're responsible for uh, collating a whole lot of information from our staff who are out and about doing their business every day, uh, adding some value to that by analysing it and then uh, feeding that back out so that uh, we're ensuring that we're deploying to the right place again uh, and that we know uh, about all those, um, maybe what we call hot, hot offenders out there, okay. those, those people who are causing the most harm in our communities. And then lastly, I've got our district youth and community teams, um, and they're made up um, of our youth engagement officers. Uh, so they're trying to um, work more with the sort of lower level youth offenders to make sure that they don't graduate in their offending. Um, and then also uh, they have the alcohol harm prevention unit, which that looks after all our licensing and our on licenses and off licenses and making sure that alcohol is not causing a harm in our community. Wow. <laughs> so it's a big work group, yeah? That's a lot. <laughs> That's a lot that you're going through. But, uh, and I'm happy to share with everyone here who is watching that uh, all that uh, Inspector Shannon Gray, those, those main groups that he uh, has just mentioned, we are going to invite those people one by one and share with you uh, what are some of the work that they've been doing. However, today, what I like to focus on is retail shop safety. So. Are you able to share with us some of the types of crime that happens to retail shops? Yeah, certainly, Jessica. I suppose the, the first main common offence that we would see occur in a shop, and um, I don't want to minimalise it or say that it's low level, but it, it's mm. the shoplifting. So when we talk about shoplifting, it's an offender or a person who walks into a store, picks an item up off the shelf, maybe conceals it in a bag or puts it in their pocket, and then, and then leaves the store without making any attempts to pay. So that's basic shoplifting. Um, so for those ones, um, who normally 
other offenders without um, putting someone or one group. But but would there be a fair to say that there's a certain group who would be the likely offenders of this kind of, of crime? Yeah, I understand what you what you're trying to ask there, and it's and it's difficult because everyone offends for different reasons. Okay. Um, and so I suppose what we can do is put them into certain categories, uh, much like uh, someone who's actually offending um, to either feed themselves. So we call that sort of hand to mouth um, offending. So you know they they may have um, difficulty with their living arrangements and can't actually afford to purchase grocery okay. items and stuff like that. So we have people who commit offences for that reason. Uh, we have other people who um, will steal high value items for the purpose of maybe fueling other addictions, whether that be drug or alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, and then of course we have opportunists. So sure. someone who will just go in, um, if the security measures or you know people aren't paying attention in stores and they see the opportunity, then they, they may seize that opportunity. So it's probably a, a rough three categories that you could place the offenders into. Okay, so just using these three categories, what would you advise our audience here if they happen to be uh, on the other end, that they are the shop owners? What, what can they do? Yeah, so there's a couple of things. Um, so obviously um, we encourage people to report shoplifting to us um, mm -hmm. uh, for a couple of reasons. Obviously we want to hold the offender accountable. Uh, we want to try and return property to its rightful owner. Mm -hmm. um, but also, um, if we don't catch that offender, uh, it also adds to the value, as I was talking about my work group before, the intelligence group, um, painting a picture around where offences are actually occurring so that we can um, deploy and be more present in certain locations if we know that there is a, a higher rate of shoplifting in those locations. I suppose my advice to, to retailers is around um, making sure that their, their shop is set up in a way that it minimises some of that um, offending. So like I talked about the opportunist, um, if there's clear visibility in the layout of the store, so mm -hmm. there's not uh, corners that are um, out of sight where offenders can take the opportunity to either uplift property or conceal property, um, that can that can be a good start. Mm -hmm. um, CCTV cameras within stores, are, they're always a good deterrent as long as there's the necessary signage and that that accompanies it. Um, and So just interrupting you, Inspector, you just mentioned CCTV. Yep. Have you come across a lot of reports that uh, back from our own uh, staff saying that, uh, I mean our own police saying that the CCTV are not operating. Are there lots of incidents yeah. like that? Yeah, that, that's quite frustrating for us when we when yeah. we move into an investigation phase of any offence. Um, is that it, you know, and that's a that's a really good recommendation I think um, for everyone is that if you've got it installed, check it, make sure it's working, uh, and if it's not working, take measures to to make sure it is working because you just never know when uh, either police or someone else will need that footage. It might just be that vital piece of the puzzle that we need to um, to solve a crime. Okay, and what about robberies then? Yeah, robbery. So I've already touched on the on the shoplifting, and, yes. and that was really where I was going to go to next. Is that uh, less common, um, but they still do occur. As of course, mm. robbery and aggravated robberies of our retail stores. Um, now, so I suppose to just to define what a what a robbery is. Um, so that's when one or more persons would enter into your store um, and either threaten violence or use violence for the purpose of taking property, whether that mm -hmm. be cash or cigarettes or alcohol or something along those lines. So obviously that's a far more serious offence than what shoplifting is uh, and that involves uh, a more significant investigation from police. All right. So if a robbery is happening, what should people do? Yeah. What should the shop owners do? Yeah, that's that's a really good question <laughs> and something that we, we want to really get across. is, um, and, and I know it's really difficult for people when their livelihood is at stake and they're seeing yeah. property being taken, but the best thing uh, advice we can give is that um, you cooperate with those offenders. Um, you know, the sooner they get what they've come for and have left the store, um, the sooner everyone is safe and the sooner um, um, people can contact police. Mm. Um, we ask people to stay alert uh, during those. I know, you know, in, in those type, type of traumatic situations, it it's, can be difficult to stay calm, but, you know, we, we suggest people stay calm. Try and take on board as much information around the offender or the offenders as they can. So, you know, height, age, uh, ethnicity, clothing, descriptions, any tattoos or marks that might um, help us identify that person later on down the track. 
and particularly when they leave the store, you know, have they left in a vehicle? Can we get a registration? Right. If they've left on foot, do we know what direction they've travelled in? Because that's a really good starting point for our, our patrols when they arrive or a, um, a police dog unit when, when they are turn up to start tracking that offender as well. Sure. Um, how successful is the police in apprehending these robbers? I'd say quite. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. So um, in preparation for this interview, actually, Jessica, I thought I'd better come with some, some facts and figures. And, <laughs> okay, good. And so when we're looking at robberies in particular, because it has been a, a very, very strong focus of police over a number of years, mm -hmm. um, is that over, uh, I think about the last uh, two to three years uh, that the figures um, relate to, is that um, we've had a clearance rate of about 62% or a resolution rate of about 62%. Okay. So what that means is that out of every 10 robberies that occur, we're catching around six or seven of the offenders and, and um, holding them to account for that offender. So, you know, by all accounts, that I is, think that's, that's a pretty that is good positive. Effort. Yeah, That is positive. Um, you mentioned something about being clear and um, in order not to become, to avoid being a target. Mm -hmm. Apart from that, is there anything else that shops should know? Yeah, so one thing with robberies that we've found, um, and it's certainly the advice that we give to store owners, and particularly the, the likes of our super eats and our dairies, is um, an offender for a, a robbery is more, or sorry, is less likely to target a store where there's good visibility from road frontage mm -hmm. into the store. So what we'll find is a lot of dairies and that will, will put posters on their windows uh, and, and obscure the view from the road. Yeah. So if we can yeah. open up that line of sight from the street into the shop, it actually makes it less of a, of a target by um, some of those offenders. Um, Obviously, and I'm sure we'll move into this, is the installation of fog cannons. Um, okay. So, you know, that's, that, they can be very, very effective uh, in a robbery type situation. Mm -hmm. And again, CCTV, um, you know, if you've got them even outside your shop as well as inside the shop and it's clearly signed, um, posted that they're in, in operation and they really are in operation, Jessica, yeah. then, you know, again, that's a great deterrent for a would-be offender. So would you say, is there any evidence that fog machines actually can deter robbers? So what we've seen, again, looking at the stats, is that we've had a um, quite a significant reduction in aggravated robberies, um, particularly when we look at the last 12 months compared to the 12 months before, across the country. Um, now, there'll be a whole lot of reasons for that, um, mm. but I'm sure that playing into that will be the use of the fog cannons mm. or the installation of the fog cannons. So. Um, I'm personally aware or uh, police are aware of um, situations where fog cannons have been deployed uh, okay. during uh, the act of an aggravator or uh, robbery um, and they have been extremely effective in disorientating the offender, um, you know, obscuring their view and also the key to that is allowing the um, shop assistant uh, to, to leave, to, leave yes. to move to a safe location, yeah. whether that be outside or into a safe room that's um, built into the, into the yes. store. And I personally think that's very important because um, life is just one. You, yep. you can't get that's it right. back if something happens. So that's yeah, exactly I just right. absolutely agree with you. So how do shop owners get one of these fog machines? So, um, so there's been 442 fog cannons installed uh, in uh, retail and, or uh, I'll start again. So there's been 442 fog cannons installed uh, over the last about 18 months to two years in oh, New Zealand. Okay. So that's a significant that's, number. That's significant. Is um, that across Tamaki Makoro? No, that's across the country. Across. Uh, so in mid-2017, uh, uh, the government uh, realised and recognised the uh, number of uh, robberies that were occurring within some of our um, smaller retailers, particularly our independent retailers. And so what they did is they invested $1.8 million into fog cannon funding. Okay. Um, so this came through as part of the Justice Seat for Funding scheme. Um, and so what we've been doing is working with retailers uh, using a priority matrix that's um, operated from Police National Headquarters. Um, so they look at the occurrences of robbery on all the um, independent retailers across the country. And those that they see as most vulnerable victims, they will send the list to me for Waimata District. Uh, I then get staff within our district to go out and fill out a comprehensive survey um, with that retailer to make sure that they meet all the criteria. At that point, if they meet all the criteria, then um, they are uh, offered uh, the opportunity to install a fog cannon. However, they need to um, meet the first $250 of the four 
odd thousand dollar retail price of that installation. Right. So that's a, I mean, it's, it's a really good incentive um, for people to have them um, installed in their stores. Obviously those stores that don't meet the criteria or haven't appeared on our priority list, um, they have still obviously have the option of, of having those independently installed mm -hmm. within their stores. But um, we've, we've installed just over 440 of those around the country uh, since that funding was made available in 2017. So, you know, that's that's a number, that's a huge number of retail stores that are now equipped with that um, great deterrent for offenders and a great tool if yeah. someone does try and uh, commit a robbery on that store. Yeah, and, and of course, as the, I've been working with the communities a lot myself, and sometimes speaking to shop owners, they don't even know their neighbours. Mm -hmm. um, what's your advice on that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that's so important. Yeah. It's so important. Uh, we encourage, I mean, police can't do our job by ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, we need the support of the community. Mm -hmm. um, we need to hear from our community, we need them to share that information with us, whether it be face to face, over the phone or via email, but more importantly, share information amongst yourselves, yeah. get to know your neighbours. Uh, you know, that, that applies in a retail setting as well as in your home setting, in your residential setting. You know, mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're living in a street, get out on the weekend, say hello to your neighbours. You know, um, we 100% we support, uh, neighbourhood support uh, being established within um, residential yeah. streets as well. And, and we promote that all the time. So yeah, so that's it's the good. best thing people that's can do. Good. So is there anything apart from, you know, you've given us a lot of information and a lot of good tips as well. So is there anything else do you think the community can do to work with the police um, so that we become safer in your, especially in your department? Mm. I was probably just adding to what I was just saying about approaching us, you know, mm. if you see a police officer out walking the beat or driving past, wave out, go up and have a chat to them. Let us know what's happening within your community yeah. because we, you know, as much as we are within the community all the time, there is stuff that we don't hear about that we need to hear about. Mm -hmm. So keep sharing that information with us. Um, I think that's probably probably the key to us. Key yeah. to key to it is let's continue to build that that relationship between community and police. We are one. Yes, definitely. And and actually, um, I'm very appreciative of the community leaders, the, the communities themselves, because um, especially from our ethnic communities, back home we may not trust the police so much, mm. but over here what I've seen is communities are trusting the police and often when the police walk by, they do go over, go up and say, hi, hello, you're doing a fantastic job and it is really pleasing to mm. see that. And I think um, this is really thanks to the communities, to the police, as, and also to the liaison officers. So one last thing, Inspector Gray. You know, in the last six months, um, after acquiring this uh, new role, I got to work with you at the Henderson Police Station. Now, I know you're so busy, but just now in, in, in the beginning of this sh uh, show, you have already talked about how many um, executive level managers are looking, uh, are working with uh, you in your, your unit, but you always carry a smile, always, you know, and you're so easy to talk to. So, but you're so busy, so can you tell us how can you keep that upbeat in you every moment? You know, I, you, you're there first thing in the morning, I think you're one of the first to arrive in the, in the office, and you're one of the last to leave the office, and yet you carry that smile and that politeness. I really want to hear, how did you keep this up? Well, I'm, I, <laughs> gosh, I'm, I'm speechless. That's a lovely thing to say, Jessica. Um, look, I think there's a couple of things, really. Um, you know, I love the job I do. Uh, I love the opportunity to come in every day and try and make a difference for the communities that we work for uh, and, and work with. Um, and. You know, it's great people like you and the others that I work for that keep me positive during the day as well. Um, but I think, you know, I've, I've been in police 21 years now um, and, you know, I've learnt um, through various leaders about the importance of being uh, consistent, um, you know, uh, cool, calm <laughs> yes. and collected. Um, and I try and apply that every day. And um, But, yeah, the bottom line is I just really love what I do and, and so why not have a smile on your face when, you, when you're doing your job. Thank you. Thank you for being you. That's all the time we have for today. 
from Inspector Shannon Gray. I think we've got a lot of information. So tune in the next time where I will be inviting Senior Sergeant Brett Betty to discuss about managing family issues. Thank you for watching Cop Chat.